I am honored to introduce Joy Boyer, who is a program director in the NHGRI Division of Genomics and Society, who will moderate the first Q&A session for today. As a program director in the NHGRI Division of Genomics and Society, Joy oversees a portfolio of research, training, and career development grants related to the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomic research. Over to you, Joy. Thank you, Chris. And um, thanks to um, all the speakers today, and particularly um, our morning speakers, Marius, Michael, and Chris. Um, I wanted to take just a few minutes. It, uh, there's been just a very rich uh, discussion in the Q&A. Um, and a number of these questions are focused more on the ethical issues around eugenics than um, the historical is issues per se. And I just wanted to say a few words um, to, to try to address these. The, the top question is asking um, about a GWAS study that was done on homosexual behavior. I'm assuming this is the Ghana et al. paper um, that was published in Science. Um, and whether uh, that paper uh, sh should be retracted, whether the authors should apologize for the paper. And I think this highlights the fact that um, eugenics is not just in our past, it's very much um, in our present. And I think there are um, awareness of the role it's played is important but equally important is to ask questions like that. How is it playing out now in our lives? And I think there, there were a number of questions of, about where do you draw the line between eugenics and genetic counseling or um, gene therapy? And I think I can't answer those questions, but I think those are questions that we as a community and um, as humanity need to be addressing. Um, so I thank you for those questions. I um, think the, uh, the historians that we have uh, on the panel right now would probably um, rather address more historical issues than focusing so much on the um, ethical issues. Um, but at this point, I would open it up to the panelists. If there are particular questions you would like to answer each other, uh, ask each other, or if, if you would like to take on um, some of the more ethical issues and bringing, bringing eugenics into the, the present day, I think is, is kind of the gist of so many of the questions. So I would open up the floor to the panelists at this point. Marius. Yes, uh, thank you, Joy, very much indeed. And uh, thank you, Michael, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you, Chris, for um, sharing with me the panel. Uh, the first thing I should like to say in compl to complement what you just said, Joy, is that whilst the conversation at the moment seems to be so located in the present and it is driven by bioethical concerns, I think what we need to do at the same time is infuse a sense of historical um, reckoning and responsibility in our discussions uh, so then we can understand better where certain ideas are coming from and how people can make an informed uh, decision based on the particular situation, uh, which is clearly um, eugenic, has a clear eugenic past, but probably, and in most cases is clearly the case, is not known by the individual in case or by the society at large. So what we're pushing forward is basically uh, a synergy between historical knowledge and scientific research and ethical concerns. As, as Michael pointed out so nicely in his paper, uh, eugenics uh, was not only created to justify a racially and socially exploitative system, it, also, it was also created to lock people into the bottom of it. It locked people of colour, it locked people with disability, it locked women, uh, so um, it locked people with various sexual orientations. So all of these concerns remain very powerful. And uh, as you said, eugenics has uh, come alive again during the pandemic. But then uh, all of these issues that we address today, I suppose, 
can be rewritten um, to understand the implications today. Ultimately, the purpose is to understand better uh, what happened in the past to come up with better solutions for the future. And we cannot disentangle history from this. Uh, and uh, geneticists and bioethicists should know um, the importance and acknowledge the importance of the past in this respect, as much as historians are trying so hard to go into the archives to uh, recuperate the voice of the victims of civilizations, for example, as Michael pointed out. Uh, so while some of the conversation uh, today is extremely geared towards ethics and towards genetics and genomics, um, there is also something lurking in the back of that conversation that we historians have the responsibility to push forward and alert people who um, otherwise may be misinformed or may be simply um, misdirected. Um, so we live in a very complex situation at the moment. We see all of these ideas coming back uh, and we can see some of the concerns that we thought we addressed in the past scientifically. Whether we're talking about abortion, we're talking about prenatal screening, we're talking about how do we care about, uh, uh, about someone with disability. All of these issues, uh, which were at the you know, front and center of debates on bioethics 20 years ago, remain extremely present. And I think the current pandemic only exacerbated the need to return to these issues and exploit, ex explore them historically. And uh, so we need to go back to what Michael suggested. We need to go back to those cases and learn from those as much as we need to go to the core of the scientific debate about human heredity and try to uh, tease out those important lessons. Thank you, Marius. I, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent point and really speaks to the whole purpose of the meeting. Um, Michael? Yeah, I would just add that, that, that that's very well put, Marius. I could, you said it brilliantly. Um, I would just also reinforce you know, the notion that we can't decouple the history from the, the current ethical debates, and we can't think about making decisions about reproductive technologies and about um, you know, uh, abortion and other things you know, without situating them in the social and cultural context within which they're made, which are deeply informed by that history, whether people are conscious of it or not. I mean, the, 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 the histories that we're outlining here in our, pre in our presentations, uh, you know, sort of created, in a sense, those, the, the, the context within which those decisions are being made. And so it's imperative to, to discuss them and, and, and think critically about, about them. Great, thank you, Michael. I think as yeah, Mary. Um, no, I just wanted to uh, uh, react to something Chris has pointed out in his presentation. I think, I think the difficulty for us, all of us, um, whether you are a historian or sociologist or a geneticist or um, um, a, a, a pastor in a church, I suppose the difficulty is that how do we come together to write a strategy uh, for everyone, for everyone to use and return to time and time again um, as different issues regarding eugenics come up in their lives. They will be confronted with eugenics at some point in their lives. How are they prepared to engage with those issues? I think we know that we could do a bit more to prepare those who aren't able to be prepared because uh, they don't have the time to read or they don't all the books about this topic or the other topic, or they simply um, uh, consider that to be a, a problematic issue. Now, we, the scholarly community, amongst many other responsibilities from civic uh, and uh, moral and scientific, we have also the responsibility to try to formulate a strategy. And I, this is something what Chris was pointing out in, in, in the discussion of uh, is the fifth myth about um, about the role of science here, role of science, we, we, we take it very seriously uh, because science can provide wonderful answers to, uh, to great uh, problems uh, characterizing our, our societies from, 
from human uh, genome to um, ecology and environmentalism. But at the same time, that comes with this extraordinary responsibility. And we are part of that. We are not detached. We are not free of responsibility. And that has to be uh, addressed directly and heads on, I think. Yeah, thank you, Marius. I would also add quickly that I think the history can inform discussions about eugenics in other ways as well, including, um, and it was mentioned as one of the myths, it was framed as, you know, did eugenics persist after, not after the Nazis, after Nazi Germany, of course, the answer is yes. Um, and I think we can, we, if we look at the history and um, think critically about the history, we can see that ex eugenics extended beyond state coercion, beyond state control, beyond state-sponsored programs, and that, you know, it's much more diffuse and pervasive in society. And, is, and that's sort of one of the reasons why um, ideas about eugenics and, and actions that we might consider eugenics um, you know, persist even in the 20th century. So I just wanted to uh, add to Michael's great point, which is to say that I think one of the, the tasks of historians and of the scholarly community is to really address eugenics in its fullness so that we have a usable workable definition which embraces a number of modalities, practices, time periods, uh, and, and functions, uh, and that at the same time with a general theory, uh, with a general framework for eugenics, we do not lose the kind of context and historical specificity which is so important. And this is the dynamic, this is the dilemma because eugenics is essentially a protean system of ideas and a, and a protean structure of practices and has undergone countless reformations. And much of the discussions of eugenics in the post after the Second World War are, are promoting practices by only defining eugenics one way. Uh, so we have to be very careful that we have an, a broad enough definition of eugenics a broad enough account of the support of eugenics, a broad enough account of the expertises and ideas aligned with eugenics, while also not uh, uh, losing that kind of complexity and historical specificity and ethical exactitude that is really necessary to make comparisons and to confront these ideas and these practices in the present day. That's great. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and um, ask a question that I think is reflecting of some of the questions that have been um, raised in the Q&A. And that is, um, how, how do current geneticists um, deal with the subtle ways that eugenics ideas creep into science today. Um, you know, a question was asked, should a, um, someone who presented a paper on the GWAS of homosexual behavior apologize for that publicly and retract the paper? And I think I would ask you, just looking at this from a historical perspective, is is that kind of activity something that should be done? Is that useful? Um, is, is addressing just one paper what we need to do or do we need to really be looking at the broader issues, genetic determinism and, uh, or genetic exceptionalism and biological determinism that still permeate genetics and science as a whole? So I would turn that over to you. You want to go, Chris? You want to go first? I, I, I was going to ask it, Marius if you wanted to go first. Okay. I yeah. can jump yeah. in really quick. And also, right, also, Michael, you can, because you well, I was just a lot of really, these issues as well. So, right. <laughs> well, I was just going to make a really quick point that, um, you know, I, I think we need to move beyond what I would call etiquette, you know, beyond sort of um, superficial uh, engagements and, and, you know, really engage in the difficult conversations around 
eugenics like the ones we're having here today. Of course, um, yeah, it's, uh, well, I'll let, I'll let Marius jump in. Well, my take uh, on it uh, would be simply to um, um, reflect immediately on the possibility of this type of studies uh, being very popular and uh, ask myself, why is that popular? The scientists have been doing this kind of, uh, and quite prominent scientists. I mean, in some cases, we have very important names. Some of them were mentioned today, others are mentioned in the uh, uh, scientific um, uh, historical uh, documents uh, accompanying this uh, symposium, uh, and people can look up online for that. Uh, some of the very prominent names here who are uh, always uh, sometimes you know, referred in connection to eugenics. So we know that these sort of things do happen. But I and my take here is simply as an as a intellectual historian uh, dealing with, with the, the legacies of eugenics is, is, is to, to, to reflect immediately on how relevant that is and how important it is to people. Because if it is very important to some people and it has traction and it echoes widely and it, it you know, percolates through so many other issues, then I'm getting very worried. And then I need, and I think one of the facets of our effort here, or one of the aims of our collective effort here, we reacted to this. We, were, we are not only at the forefront of genomics, but also we want to be the vanguard of anti-eugenics uh, presence in science. And to do that, you react immediately with whatever you have to debunk, dismantle, uh, and confront the type of lingering uh, thought that continues to permeate certain scientific uh, practices, whether we're talking about a particular group of people, and we've seen papers about you know, the Ashkenazi Jews, or whether about the, the, the Roma people, or about a particular collective uh, or a particular community in Africa, about you know, various um, uh, sexual orientated groups. These are recurrently happening. Uh, how do we react to that, uh, Joy, is, is one matters at the moment, because we know of scientists, we always, various scientists, we always continue to do that. And now with CRISPR and gene editing and various papers being published on even more uh, uh, genetic determinism and the possibility of, believe, of suggesting to people that uh, you know, your destiny is in your genes. Uh, that has become such a powerful uh, story that to engage with that forcefully requires an entire arsenal of arguments. So um, that particular paper you mentioned is, is in my opinion, only uh, one part of a very complex story. Uh, uh, notwithstanding uh, you know, the criticism it received, I think from our point of view, uh, from what we're discussing today and tomorrow is that how we react to that type of argument is, uh, is what uh, we, we, we need to consider and reflect uh, individually and collectively. And I think we did provide, the three of us today, uh, this morning, we provided some, some indication of where or to, to which direction we may take this conversation. I hope there will be others who can you know, help us. Um, work with us and suggest better ways of dealing with these uh, with these uh, issues. Yeah. I I just wanted to add to what Marius is saying, which I fully agree with, uh, and to also uh, emphasize the second part of your question statement, Joy, which is to say that these these issues it's not one particular paper, but these kinds of issues are all part of wider discussions about genetic exceptionalism, about genetic determinism. These are conversations that the LC research community has had for more than 30 years, that the bioethics community has also had you know, uh, for, for uh, more than 30 years. Um, I think at root, um, the, we just need to have a, a, a wider series of conversations which lead to wider cultural changes about how we talk about genetics and how we talk about genes and how we talk about uh, it, basically, uh, the how we pathologize any perceivable difference, all of the, and how we normalize and ableize various individuals, various bodies, uh, various uh, groups, and I think this is all. Uh, it's not simply one paper. This paper is 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 needs to be discussed 
among a variety of dialogues which take into account, I think, uh, and, and which try to move forward, just very basic educational principles which emphasize pluralism and which emphasize participation and which emphasize and which as much as possible avoid what I call an ontological dehumanization of groups and peoples. Yeah, I think this is the key word, sorry to jump in, dehumanization, Chris. I mean, ultimately, you need to, to, you need to say it out loud, all human life in all forms is valuable. And there's no, um, there's no uh, absolutely nothing uh, um, convincing uh, scientific and moral and religious to determine that some people are, are less worthy than others. I think that has to be stated very clearly. And uh, as Chris pointed out, there, ultimately, regrettably, many of this eugenic uh, behavior or much of this eugenic behavior that we see today remains embedded in certain trajectories of thought um, that have to be expunged. And we have to excise that kind of thinking, not only from the government action, not only from the type of uh, conversation we have publicly, but ultimately also from the way research is being conducted and the way scientific communities uh, uncontrollably sometimes and uncritically continue certain patterns of behavior and thought because they never uh, look back at their discipline and reacted critically towards the foundation of their own discipline. And it has to be pushed forward uh, with as much conviction as possible, I think. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to um, some of the questions that have come in from the uh, meeting participants. The first one is from Sarah Chestnut, and she um, suggests that she'd be interested in hearing more about how eugenics played a role in America's mass inca incarceration complex. So. Chris, did you want to answer that? I see you're unmuted. Oh, I think this is actually more of a Michael question, although uh, it depends on, yeah. So uh, Michael, do you mind perhaps starting our discussion of this? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that I spoke to it a bit in the video or in the my presentation. Um, I, I, you know, I, um, Certainly incarcerated populations, even very recently, have been targeted for, for sterilization or surreptitious sterilization. And, and things like Norplant in the 1990s were popular um, for, a, um, for a while among people who were um, interested in limiting the reproduction of people um, receiving um, or you know, receiving benefits and things. Um, so there's, there's a number of ways in which eugenic ideas have been kind of racialized and modernized and, and have, been, have worked their way into the social welfare system and into um, incarceration, incarcerated, incarceral settings. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I've, as I stated in the talk, there's, you know, kind of the, one of the really direct results of eugenics, I think, was the, the massive uh, institutionalization of a broad range of people in the first 50 years or 60 years of the 20th century. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, yeah, I would just leave, leave it there for now, if somebody else wants to answer. Marius? Yeah, very briefly, um, I, I would like to add something and thank you for the question. I think uh, uh, the first thing to, to be said is that eugenics provided a very interesting justification for incarceration, uh, not just in America, but everywhere, by simply suggesting that uh, we can separate criminals from the rest of society. And by doing that, we protect, we protect the majority of the people. We protect the society from its um, you know, uh, criminals, a social, these genetic elements. So eugenics perpetually put forward these uh, ideas of, you know, protecting society from, you know, they did the same with the feeble-minded people, they did the same with the criminals. So uh, from early on, there is a very interesting connection between eugenics and incarceration as a practice, and then between eugenics and legal, uh, uh, legal sciences. So obviously to find the legal foundation, how that incarceration becomes possible. 
And that's a very interesting uh, interplay between eugenic ideas and legal systems, not just in the United States of America, but across the world. In connection to that comes the second point. Most of the early cases, as we know, of both sterilization and castration of criminals happens within the discussion about penal colonies, incarceration, and prisons. So it's very interesting, particularly in the American context, we have a, a, a wealth of uh, historical information that, that could be very useful to those of us looking back, trying to see how in, you know, America became basically, and I'm paraphrasing Karl Marx here in a very weird way, the prison of people. It has the largest incarceration system in the world. If I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe I am mistaken, but last time I checked. So how did we get to this point? And uh, eugenesis, and here of course, is, is the term is applied to legal reformers, uh, legal uh, experts, uh, superintendents, uh, people who run prisons and people who wrote the legal uh, foundations of various uh, uh, directions in our uh, system, they all believed that they can do something about, about these people. So, um, yeah, eugenics played a very important role. And uh, this is only of the, I base, base, barely scratched the surface of this uh, very important history. Michael obviously knows um, much more about it, but there would be a very short answer to a very complex and important question. Uh, I think an equally short answer to this complex question is another, is just reminding everyone of, a, of another tenant of the, the eugenic mindset, which is to say that there are easy solutions to complex social problems. And I think that's something to really emphasize. I also think there's a broader question which I'm uh, not expert enough to answer about the pattern of justice in the United States uh, of justice in the United States, often sometimes being modeled on on retributionist justice rather than remunerative justice. So I think that's also something to keep in mind most broadly. And I think too, I would just briefly add, and of course, you can't make a one-to-one -one correlation. People didn't leave institutions and enter jails and prisons. But as deinstitutionalization accelerated in the last second half of the 20th century, massive incarceration increased. And, and uh, jails and prisons in places like Chicago and LA and New York, um, you know, have, it's been found that anywhere between 40 and 60% of, in, of the incarcerated people in those settings have some sort of mental health problem or, or condition. And so, um, as I said, while you can't make a simple one-to-one -one sort of correlation of moving people out of one institution into another, um, you know, I think part of the more complex legacies of, of eugenics is the, the rise of mass incarceration and the movement of mental health care for certain segments of the population into those carceral settings. As, and, and I think which is sort of underlined um, by what Marius said about kind of the justifications, you know, for removing so-called criminal types from society that has a very long history in the United States. Um, another question from Derek Schultz. Was there a complete cons consensus among eugenicists regarding what traits were desirable for the human race and who was unfit? Um, yeah, another another brilliant question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, wow. Um, no, that's the short answer. And I, we might be puzzled uh, because, of course, when we hear someone talking about eugenics, the first impression, uh, regrettably, the first impression we get is it was a homogenous uh, movement and everybody more or less agreed about either positive or negative methods of improving the human race an improvement in, in quotation marks and race. Uh, so, but it wasn't like that. Uh, not only did they diverge uh, radically of uh, bio, uh, ideological, political, and religious beliefs, but they also disagreed over which are the traits that constitute. Uh, there were there were some basic uh, things they agreed on, um, things related to social standing, intellectual achievement, 
Uh, of course, the color of the skin, um, we have not uh, perhaps enough insisting on this aspect. Uh, it was always, of course, the white people who, uh, without explicit uh, reference to some of them, but there was always the, the, the prototype, the eugenic idea what was always um, the, the white male, uh, and then, of course, the white woman. Uh, uh, the white female. So you had all of these, there are some basic criteria uh, uh, what constituted the, the traits uh, worthy of uh, reproduction and worth, worthy of pursuing from a eugenic point of view. As much as there were a, a basic consensus about the negative traits, what constituted the unfit. And Michael and Chris mentioned already, we talked about feeble-mindedness, we talked about criminality, we mentioned asocials, alcoholics, so they did. They did create a list. There is a a, a list of uh, things you are that are desired, and things uh, or a list of traits which were undesired. And but there was uh, there was disagreement, and in some cases, very significant one. Uh, at the moment when, for example, and, and I don't want to monopolize this conversation, I'll be very quick in a footnote. The moment when genetics, in a way, clearly was to separate from from eugenics. This is the crux of their disagreement, which are the traits. Because of course, a, a eugenicist of, uh, you know, old fashioned eugenicists who, who didn't have much knowledge of uh, genetics would have a very different list about what is worthy, uh, more culturally and socially and religiously biased towards what constitutes a worthy person. Whilst uh, someone with a good knowledge of genetics would actually be very easily, would be very easy for, for that person to debunk the old fashioned eugenic arguments about worthiness and unworthiness. However, they, they did agree uh, on some basic things. And uh, so that's, uh, that's something we need to keep in mind that uh, A, it wasn't uh, without disagreement, and B, uh, what they agreed upon was regrettably more important than what they disagreed. Yeah, that's very well put, Maurice. And I would just quickly add, I know we're out of time, um, but I would quickly add that, and Comfort has written about this and called it medical eugenics. Um, but I, I think that, and I made the point in my talk briefly, that the creation of those tools of statistics and laboratory tests and intelligence tests and psychiatric and psychological evaluations are part of what revealed so-called defectiveness to eugenesis. And, um, and so that was one way that they reached a sort of loose kind of consensus about who would be considered defective. And also, I think I would just briefly add too that they had complex understandings of race so that, you know, Jewish people or Southern and Eastern Europeans could be considered of a different race and, and genetically unfit. Um, you know, and so there weren't, there wasn't a simple sort of black, white, um, you know, dichotomy you know, in, within eugenics. I, I would just add also, because we're out of time, I think the, the, the bewildering variety of traits, many of which are nonsensical that, that eugenicists use, uh, is part of the, the malicious power of eugenics, its adaptability. And I think given that as well, the idea that at the core of all of these discussion of traits is this idea, this mistaken idea that difference is pathology. And that's really what, uh, uh, what grounded all of these discussions. And, it, you know, and as Mike points out very well, you know, we, this is also a big uh, a core discussion about ability and disability, which is at the root of many of these discussions and which uh, allows eugenics to to continually manifest itself in differing ideas and practices and to continue and to discontinue with, with little interruption in many cases. So that's what I will add. Thank you, Chris, Marius, and Michael. This has been a terrific start to the meeting. And thank you to all the participants for your questions. I have a feeling that these are gonna be questions that are going to be um, discussed and it, it explored throughout the next two days. So again, thank you everyone. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, I think, to um, yes. tell us what we're doing now. 
So there will be a break until uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. So we will break for about one hour. Thank you.